I'm talking this morning on this subject. What a mix. Generosity, idolatry, and Christianity. Those are the three things that's in this text. If you're physically able, would you stand in honor of the reading of God's word? The Bible says when these things were accomplished, Paul, listen to this word, purposed in the spirit. When he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a while. And about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, or Demetrius, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned many people, saying that they are no gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. And when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia who were his friends sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another for the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the wonderful music the time of giving, now speak to us from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. What a mix. Generosity, idolatry, and Christianity. The truth of this passage magnifies to us as believers this reality. The church progresses under persecution. Effectiveness and persecution usually go hand in hand. Since an effective church is normally a bold church, and a bold church is often a church made strong through times of suffering. It's still true that salt stings when it's rubbed into the wound, and light reveals the deeds that are evil done in darkness. So this type of teaching can provoke a hostile reaction. As I've made my way through the book of Acts, I found it interesting to take a stop at each of Paul's preaching points and note what happened. In Jerusalem, persecution came from organized religion. In Antioch, it stemmed from prejudice and envy. In Lystra, it was the result of paganism. In Philippi, it was the reaction to victory over the demonic realm. In Thessalonica, it came from an unruly mob. In Athens, the gospel faced the opposition of worldly philosophy. In Corinth, it came from Judaism. Wherever the church boldly and faithfully proclaims the gospel, it always faces satanic opposition. Now, we have entered into the city of Ephesus, where Paul will spend three years, where he will later commend one of his young protégés, Timothy, to become the pastor of the church in Ephesus. I want you to note that in this city there are hardened hearts. There is hypocrisy and hatred energized by materialism toward the gospel. I want to talk to you about a couple of things in this text. First of all, listen to this statement. I want to talk to you about ministry with purpose. I've never studied the word purpose in the New Testament. The word purpose used in verse 21 from the Greek New Testament would translate mental action. I'd like to think that I get up every day with purpose, that my 
mentality that God has given me, my mental capacity is engaged, there's action to face each day and to believe that God has something in particular, a purpose he wants me to be involved with. I want you to note several words that refer to Paul's purpose. First of all, he landed in the area of generosity. He made this statement. He said, I purpose in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I had been there, I must also see Rome. He had it laid out. Now, let me just be quick to say, if you'll read Proverbs chapter 16 in verse 1, verse 9, and verse 33, the Bible talks about how we make plans in our heart, but God directs our steps. Mentally, I'm thinking, you know, God, here's what I'd like to do with the rest of my life. I just try to serve God, Brother Ron, the best I can, but it's the Lord Jesus Christ that orders the steps, the Bible says, of a good man. We're going to find out that he does not go through Macedonia and Achaia right now. He's going to send Erastus and he's going to send Timothy. He's going to go later and the Bible gives us insight as to why. But the question is, why is he concerning himself with Macedonia and Achaia? And by the way, might I say to you as he gets ready to make his journey, this is in the opposite direction from Jerusalem. He is going to go out of his way. He is going to add days to his journey because he feels he needs to go there. Many in the church at Jerusalem were poor and in need of substantial financial assistance. Can I say something? Let's fast forward from first century Bible teaching to the 21st century. Did you know that in the greater Woodstock area, they are people that are poor and that are in need of financial assistance. And I'm grateful to be able to say, God, give me the passion in the heart of the Apostle Paul that I'd be willing to go out of my way pick up some groceries, even if it inconvenience me, put it on your schedule because somebody needs help. So to meet that need, Paul wanted to take to Jerusalem a love offering with him from a largely Gentile church he had founded. Now think about this. The church was founded right there in Jerusalem, and now the church is birthed, and it goes out from that Jewish community, and there's great text here for us to study. And as it goes out, he doesn't forget from where they started. They do not forget the rock from which they were hewn. And so as a result, he wins these Gentiles to Christ, and there's great hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles. But he's going to teach these Gentiles how to love Jews by reaching in their pockets and giving of their finances to give an offering to take care of people. And by the way, the Bible goes into great detail in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 that the church at Macedonia was dead level poor. Rock bottom destitution is the Greek meaning. And yet out of their poverty, they trusted God and gave a worthy offering to the poor Jewish saints in Jerusalem. Listen to what the Bible says about this offering. Romans 15, 25. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make certain contributions for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtor. Listen, for if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, God gave us the Bible through the Jews. God gave us the Savior through the Jews. I mean, our biblical history is founded on the Jews. And he said, don't you forget, they gave you spiritual things. Their duty also is to minister to them in material things. You know what I love about my Bible? It is so blooming practical. It's not got to be so complicated that we preach over your heads and you don't understand. Only God could orchestrate when I opened the book of Acts over a year ago to teach every verse in the book of Acts that I would be right where there's a collection being taken today to help just like there was a collection being taken there. That may not impress you, but it does something in my spirit. Listen to 1 Corinthians 16. It describes how they're going to take the offering. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collection when I come. In other words, I don't need to ask for it when I get there. When I get there, you just place it in my hand, and I'll keep going. I like that. 
And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. He said, find you an accountable person that can handle this gift and we will send them. And it happened to have been Titus. Listen to James chapter 2, verse 15. Remember, this is the half-brother of Jesus Christ, raised with him in the house in Jerusalem, did not believe that his brother was who he said he was until after his brother died, was buried, and rose from the dead. After his resurrection, the Bible teaches that James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, became a follower. Listen to what he said, James 2, 15. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Let me go from generosity to unity in verse 21. See, by contributing to the financial needs of the Jewish believers at Jerusalem, these Gentiles would emphasize the church's unity. Did you know the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, and if any one member suffers, all the members suffer with it, or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Let me move to a third word. That is the word destiny. Paul was a man of purpose. Look at me. Look, look this way. He was a man of destiny. He believed under God with the help of Jesus Christ, he was going somewhere. He, he wasn't just sort of living life, well, another week, uh, just get through this week, be glad when this is behind me, hurry up and get it over with. No, he said, I must also see Rome. Isn't that amazing? Have you noticed how I've been teaching week by week? He went to the major metropolitan cities in order to plant the gospel of Jesus Christ. Strategy. Now, he will eventually get to Rome. Matter of fact, when we get to chapter 21, the rest of the book, we're going to talk about how he gets there. Although he does not get there by the means he envisioned. God may tell you you're going somewhere, but you may not go there by means that you had envisioned. God may choose to teach you that there's as much that he wants you to learn in the journey as he does the destination. And by the way, as my friend John Maxwell said, life is not a jet destination, life is a journey. Listen to Romans 15, Paul talks about it. And so I've made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. Let me talk to my mission people for a moment. For years, our church has been involved in what we call the unreached people groups of the world. There is now 650 unengaged unreached people groups of the world that have at least 100,000 people in their unreached people group that have no access to the gospel. And you pray for this church, pray for your pastor, pray for others that I'm in relationship with that we would be able to say with Paul, what right does people in America have to continue to hear the gospel when the majority of the people outside the nation have never clearly understood the gospel? There's 1.6 billion people that have no Bible in their translation. Nobody there aiming at bringing them to Christ. And Paul said, I want to go and build where no other man has laid a foundation. In Romans 1.11, he says, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established. He knew there were some believers in that city, and he wanted to be with them. Well, let me move to a fourth word. It's the word opportunity. In verse 22, he says, So he sent into Macedonia two who went to minister to him. I have a question to ask. Wait a minute, Paul. You just said you wanted to go to Macedonia and Achaia. Now you're sending Timothy and Erastus there. Why didn't you go? Well, we can learn why he didn't go from 1 Corinthians chapter 6 in verse 8 and 9. He said, but I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great and effective door has opened to me and there are many adversaries. And might I add, as I told my deacons this morning, anytime God opens a great big door, there are always many adversaries, opposition. So we see a mission in this man's life. We see a man that has ministry with a purpose. Let me go a step further. Let me talk to you for a moment about the mission with persecution. What was the persecution toward? Was it toward me? No. It's toward Christ. You say, but I feel it. Yeah, because if it can affect you, God won't be glorified through your life. But it's ultimately toward God. Somebody says the devil hates me. I'm not even sure he knows most of us are around. He hates God. It is God. God he wanted to dethrone. You may say, well, I believe he'd like to bring you down too, Pastor Johnny. But the only reason he wants to bring me down is that I can no longer plant truth in your life that will glorify God. 
It is a God factor, ladies and gentlemen. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's about God. And so he's saying, "There's look what he says. Look at verse 23. And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. It didn't say about Paul. What is the way? The way would be equivalent to saying about Christianity. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It was against the way. The persecution came against Jesus Christ. Why? Look at verses 19 and, and verse 20 in particular, chapter 19. The word of God was prevailing. You go somewhere and the word of God starts going out with power. And I'm telling you, the devil will come against that church. The devil will come against that ministry. And he will find his greatest heyday in the life of those of you that are gossipers. Believe anything you hear without testing the spirit. God, I'm going to help you illustrate this thing. Look at verse number 24. What's it really, what's this all about? For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. Uh, and that means all the other silversmiths. He called them together with the workers of similar op- occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity in this trade. What's prosperity got to do with them opposing the gospel? We'll keep reading. Moreover, you see in here that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. Really? Not gods made. See, they were making their little gods, just like people in America and other countries would have a little carved image that they would bow before. You don't have to go to Africa to find idolatry. Some of us bow before our checkbook every week. Some of us bow at the shrine of our job and see that as the provision instead of the God who gives us breath. So not only... Uh, is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute? Now, wait a minute. Evident- he wasn't getting enough interest there. Evidently, those old silversmiths didn't care. They were thinking they were going to make it. And he said, let's throw, let's. Anytime you want to talk about idolatry and don't go over real big, add a noble cause to it. Take the money out of abortion and doctors would never, 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 never passionately desire to take a baby out of a woman's womb. But you put the dollars there and it almost becomes a noble cause. The temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised. Her max, remember, she was one of the seven wonders of the world in the first century. Her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia, whole worlds worshiping her. They had holidays, Troy, where people went to Ephesus and they said, you know, the grandchildren wanted us to bring them something, and they would bring them a statue of Diana, a pagan goddess where prostitutes offered themselves to the priests and to the sailors in the city of Ephesus and they did it in God's name. What's the big deal? Why are you picking on Paul and the Christian faith? This is interesting. Because Demetrius saw something. He saw that the gospel works. He saw that if people really embraced the gospel, they laid aside their idolatry. He said, I'll tell you what, if he keeps preaching and people keep getting saved, we're going out of business. Wait, look, can I ask the church a question? I'm just full of questions. Are we putting anybody out of business? Is there any doctor, is there any medical doctor come to Woodstock and been changed and sat down, shut down an abortion clinic? 
Are there any bars that are going out of business because the membership no longer frequents those? They, they were scared of the message that Paul preached. I'll guarantee you one thing. It was not, I'm okay, you're okay. So what he said is, listen, boys, I've called this meeting. We're in trouble. We're in a, we're in a lake full of alligators and Paul's draining the water. Verse 28, and when they heard this, they were full of wrath. That Greek word, ticked off. Cried out saying, listen to what he said, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana. And I'm going to show you in a moment. You know what they did? Listen to this. For two solid hours, you're talking about an idolatrous frenzy. For two hours, my Bible says, they cried, great. It's the temple, Diana. Listen to this, the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord and they couldn't find Paul, so they seized two of his companions, two Macedonians, Paul's travel companions, Caius and Aristarchus. Can I just brag on Aristarchus for a minute? You'll not only find him here, when Paul leaves, he's going with him. Paul's imprisoned, listen to this, make sure you understand this, when Paul was imprisoned in Rome, guess who asked for the privilege to stay with him in prison? Aristarchus, God bless him. Look what Paul did. Now, Paul, boy, he's running scared now. Word comes to him. Paul, have you heard what happened? They took Gaius, Aristarchus. Man, they've got him. I don't know what they're going to do to him. Paul, what are you going to do? Listen to verse number 30. And when Paul wanted to go to the people, the disciples would not let him. He said, I want to go over there too where they're holding him, them. <laughs> Good night. You're talking about boldness. And do you, do you have the audacity to say, well, that weren't a very wise decision? You're questioning Paul's decision? He said, put me where the action is. I'm not afraid of him. So I tried to study that from a scholarly perspective of what other scholars have said, not me. And here's, here's what I found out. Paul thought to himself, what an opportunity. And you're going to read further. I was, at the, I, was, I was in the arena that Paul's talking about. It seats 25,000. And the Bible says that it was full. 25,000 people. No, Paul thought, son, let me at them. I love it. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonica chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 9, for they themselves declare concerning what manner of entry we had to you and how we turned to God from idols to serve the living God. Well, let me just um, walk through this text and I'll be through. The Bible says some of the officials, by the way, those would have been Roman officials, and we believe they were those who actually were the officials in the Olympia Games. And look what the Bible says. They were officials of Asia uh, who were his friends sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Now, here, this is really thrown uh, historians for a loop. Paul had officials that were friends. The gospel preacher he was, yeah. They were listening to him. See, Paul lived in such a way that his walk shouted so loud that it gave him a right when everything was silence to speak and be heard. Is our walk, are y'all with me? Is our walk giving us the opportunity to say what Christ has told us to say? Or do people look at us sometimes and say, what right do you think you have to say that because they've observed how he lived. The Bible says some of them cried one thing and another. There was confusion. Listen to this. And most of them did not know why they had come together. Now, that may be said in a confused Ephesus theater that a whole 25,000, but God forbid, y'all do know why we came together, don't you? Most of them didn't even know. There was just kind of confusion. Well, I don't know. What do you think he said today? Well, what do you think we ought to do with this message? And then they drew Alexander out of the multitude. Bottom line is that didn't work. But notice in verse 34, for two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And then, this is interesting, verse number 35 says, then a city clerk, quite a crowd. Let me, let me translate that for modern day vernacular. The mayor, the mayor of Ephesus stepped up, quieted a crowd. And look what he said. Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of 
of, of Ephesians is temple and guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus, which translates heaven. They believe that Diana came from heaven. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. That's interesting. There's no way it can be denied. The falsehoods, no way to deny them from their perspective. And so he, he quiets the crowd down. He says, for you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Here is a mayor in a city, an unbeliever of the way of Christianity. But he is able to discern character. And he says, man, you can forget it. When you want to deal with Aristarchus, you want to deal with Gaius, and you want to deal with the Apostle Paul, forget it. These charges are false. I'll guarantee they won't hold water because these are good men. Ladies and gentlemen, God help us to live in such a way that we earned a platform before the officials of our city, the officials of our state, and of this nation to be able to share the gospel and no one ever call our character into account. It becomes a major platform to share the gospel. Paul was a man of perception. You may say, Pastor Johnny, you really believe he wanted to go in that theater where there was 25,000 people for two hours in a frenzy, hollering and screaming, great as Diana? How could he do that? Well, I read a little further ahead, and I'm going to tell you. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He was a fearless man, and I had so much more I was going to tell you, but basically what he was saying, I am willing to go in there because I'll do anything to see people come to Christ. Wow, what boldness. God wants you to live with purpose in your spirit, to share a message. And listen to me, please listen to me. Pray that God give you the discernment that when something's wrong, you don't allow noble causes to cover the sin. You may say, but you don't know what the money goes for. It don't matter what the money goes for. Wrong is never right, and right is never wrong. Heavenly Father, speak in this invitation. Thank you for your word. May Paul be the person we seek to emulate as he emulates Christ and Jesus being the head of the church to do the will of God.